Hi, welcome to Amazing Grace Online. Glad you're here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for dropping in. We are currently in the series called The Gospel of Mark. And today's lesson is uh, lesson number four, Mark chapter two. Mark chapter two has 28 verses in it. And so we're going to divide this up into five sections. And our first section is Jesus heals the paralytic. And that is seen in chapter two, verses one through 12. I want to encourage you, if you haven't done so, please download the Companion Study Guide. Uh, you can find that at agstpaul.com under this week's Bible study. Well, let's ask the Lord to bless our time together before we read the word. Father, thank you for bringing us together today. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would lead, guide, and direct our steps through the word today. And we thank you for the encouragement of your word. And Lord, we pray that that you would bring hope to each one of us as we gather, that if there's somebody that's struggling, we pray that this time together in your word will strengthen faith, and we thank you for the revelation of Jesus within the pages of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's take a look at Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the, to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, Get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them. This, amazing, this amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Quite a story to begin with here today. And uh, let's take a look at our first question. The first question is, what do you notice about Mark's description of Capernaum in relation to Jesus? Did you catch that one word that sticks out in verse 1? Mark refers to Capernaum as home. Capernaum now became a base camp for Jesus' ministry. We know that Capernaum is the home of Simon and Andrew, and it was at their house in Mark chapter 129. That was last week's study. We looked a little at little detail of that. Peter's mother-in-law was healed of a fever and so forth. That happened at the home of Peter. Well, the home that they were in probably was Peter's house. Uh, as mentioned, that this became kind of a base camp for them. Uh, going on to question two, how does, how does Mark describe the scene surrounding Jesus? This is verses two to four. Well, notice that Mark describes that a very large crowd was gathered both within the house and outside the house. Jesus was preaching to those gathered around. Remember that the last time that Jesus was here, so many people gathered that they, they were getting healed. They wanted healing and Jesus didn't have the opportunity to preach. So he said to his disciples, let's go on to another place. They went on to another place. Now they're returning and Jesus is here preaching. He's preaching in Peter's house. Uh, in those days when a rabbi was at a house, Anybody could come and listen to the rabbi teach. And I think this is where the crowds came from. And we, kn we know that even some uh, teachers of the law, the Pharisees, Pharisees now had gathered. We're going to see a lot about the Pharisees in this lesson because they're coming now to check Jesus out. And they've heard of him and so forth. And now they're coming and listening to him. And there's going to be a few run-ins. So our first run-in is in this, this section as we read. Well, as Jesus is teaching and preaching in, the, in Peter's house, four men came with a paralytic on a mat, and they attempted to bring the man in through the door, but it was blocked. The door was blocked. So the men took the paralytic up to the roof, and re they removed portions of this roof, and they lowered the man down to where Jesus was in the house. Well, question number three, how does Mark describe Jesus' response to the four men and the paralytic? In verse 5, 
Well, Mark describes Jesus' response to their faith, noting that Jesus saw their faith. You see, their faith was evident in the actions of not only the four men, but also the paralytic. The paralytic and the four men uh, who were lowering him down into the house, they were displaying faith. This is interesting because sometimes, I think a lot of times we think that our faith is something that is unseen. It's something that we live and walk and, and breathe within, internally in us. But faith spills out into our lives. You know, we, faith is, is action. And here we see that these men carrying the mat and the man on the mat, they all have faith in Jesus. They have faith that Jesus can heal this man. And so they do whatever it takes. And notice that their faith is really uh, propelling them to do things probably that they normally uh, wouldn't do. Like go up on a roof of somebody else's house, Peter's house, and, and opening it up, removing tiles and stuff. And I believe that when they were up on the roof uh, opening it up, uh, maybe some, some dirt and some other things were coming down on the crowd beneath. And so they were causing an interruption here. Well, question number four, what did Jesus do that initiated the man's he healing? And why does this seem like an unusual response for what the man needed? Did you catch verse five? Jesus saw them, he saw their faith, and then he speaks to this man and he said, son, the man on the, the paralytic, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. Friends, what we perceive is, the, is this man's deepest need, and that's healing from paralysis, Jesus reveals the deepest need of all people, not just this paralytic, but everyone. You see, all suffering is from people's separation from God by way of sin. This man's greatest need was not immediate healing for his body, but forgiveness of sin for his soul. And so this is what began to cause the stir. All right, so with the, the teachers of the, of the law, we'll see that in a few moments. Well, verse 6 Question number five. In verse six, Mark shifts the attention of the audience to the teachers of the law. They were present in the audience. What problem did they have with Jesus? Well, notice that the teachers of the law didn't openly express their problem with Jesus verbally. They were thinking it in their, in their hearts. Their true feelings about Jesus. They thought, who is this? And then they quickly accused Jesus of blasphemy. And the reason for this is because Jesus openly forgave this man's sins. Well, in question number six, in verses eight and nine, Jesus confronts the teachers of the law and their critical thoughts. How does Jesus challenge them in their faulty thinking? He challenged them with a series of questions. First question is, why are you thinking these thoughts? Stop there for a moment. Jesus knows their thoughts. This is one of the attributes of, of, the, of God, that he knows all. That's called omniscience. God is all-knowing, and Jesus knew what they were thinking in their hearts. The second question that Jesus asked them is this one. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? Jesus asked the question, which is easier? And the answer was neither. Because with man, it's impossible. But with God, it's not only possible, but it's easy for him to do. The teachers of the law reasoned that the forgiveness of sin could not be verified because it was something spiritual and not physical. And so their, their beef is kind of twofold here, is that they have a problem with Jesus forgiving sins because they think that's blasphemous. But then they're going, well, there's no way to verify that if the man's sins are really forgiven because how do you verify something spiritual? You can't see it. Well, this is where we go on now to question seven, Mark chapter two, verses 10 to 11. How did Jesus verify who he was to the teachers of the law? Jesus spoke directly to them and, and spoke, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. But that you may know, or you may know, this is a, a sense of, this is proof. So the, the healing brought verification to Jesus as the Son of Man because he does have authority to forgive sins. And we see that authority in action by his for, pronouncing forgiveness of sins of this man and then saying, take up your mat and walk. 
So that healing verified who Jesus is, that he is the Son of Man who has the authority to forgive sins. Question number eight. By the man getting up off his mat and the praise of God in the house, what did this man's healing verify to all that witnessed his miracle? Well, we kind of go on here uh, with what we said in, in the previous verses, 10 and 11, that this healing verified that Jesus is the Son of Man and does have authority to forgive sins. Jesus did a miracle that they could see and that also verified the miracle that they could not see, the forgiveness of sins. Let's look at the calling of Levi. This is section two of our five parts. Uh, Mark chapter two, verses 13 through 17. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It's not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. With this, we now come to uh, uh, question number nine. The scene now shifts to Jesus and, te and teaching a large crowd as they were walking along this, the lake. And this would be the Sea of Galilee. Who is it that is invited to follow Jesus and why is this unusual? Well, we see Levi, the son of Alphaeus. He's sitting at a tax collector's booth. Levi is a tax collector. And he's known as Matthew, and we, we, we believe that Matthew is his apostolic name of, by which he became known, and the Gospel of Matthew uh, shares his name. Well, tax collectors were despised by Jews, and so this is why this is kind of a shocking moment to the crowds who were following along the lake. Can you just picture this in your mind, that Jesus is walking with this crowd, and he's teaching them, uh, by the Sea of Galilee. It must have been a beautiful day along the shore and they're walking along and Jesus is teaching them. And Jesus sees Levi's uh, table and so he goes over there and he says, follow me. And Levi gets up and he follows Jesus. Tax collectors were despised by Jews and considered traitors. They were employed by Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch of Galilee. Tax collectors also used uh, extortion to line their own pockets. And so what they actually did is they collected taxes not only for Rome, but they also collected more money and anything extra they could use to line their own pockets. And so they were not liked at all. Well, question number 10, how did Levi respond to Jesus? Well, as we mentioned earlier, he got up and followed Jesus immediately. We're left with the impression, this is, at least this is the impression that I get, is that he left his tax collector's booth, he left the records, he left the money all on that table and he followed Jesus. He left it completely. And so you talk about leaving a life, well, he left that life. Well, we see in this passage too that he held a, a dinner or a banquet as it's described. A banquet is held in honor of Jesus. And here, Levi invited all of his tax collector friends to come and join. And it's noted that tax collectors and sinners came to his house. Well, question number 11, once again, Mark points out a run-in with the teachers of the law. This time, what is it that, that, that caught their attention and why? This is seen in verses 16 and 17. Well, they observed that Jesus was eating with sinners and tax collectors. I want to just mention something here, that Jesus is the honored guest in Levi's home. And it's almost, it, it looks as though that Jesus is the host because Jesus was eating with the sinners and the tax collectors. I want you to remember something here, that Jesus is not condoning sin in this gathering. He's not doing that at all. What he's doing is he's showing that he is approachable and that he values every single life. He values every single person. And this is where 
Every single person has the right to hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And Jesus is demonstrating this by going to them and sitting and eating with these folks as they're gathered around. The word sinners were people characterized by the Pharisees as people who were untaught by the law. So it's not just a, a specific type of people doing a specific type of sin. It was anyone considered untaught by the law, not walking out, not walking out what the law prescribed and so forth. And tax collectors were included in this because they're not walking by the law as well. They're considered traitors and so forth. So they have a, they look, the Pharisees looked at this as a collection of tax collectors and sinners, people who were not doing the law. And so they were outsiders. Well, question number 12 is how did Jesus respond to the criticism of the Pharisees or the teachers of the law? Verse 17. Well, look at what he, he said. He responded with this statement. It's not, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. The teachers of the law were called Pharisees. The word Pharisee means separated ones. They separated themselves from everything they thought was unholy, and they thought everyone except themselves was separated from the love of God. Jesus' response identified himself as the physician of the soul. He doctored those who were sick with sin. Unfortunately, the Pharisees didn't realize that they were sick with sin, just like those they were accusing Jesus, uh, Jesus of being hung, hanging around with as ha being sinners and so forth. They were just as guilty of sin. They refused to see their own sickness of sin in their lives. Well, let's move on to our next area, uh, area number three. Jesus questioned about fasting, and this is seen in verses 18 through 20. Let's read that. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? They cannot so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will ta be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. The scene now moves from feasting to fasting. There's a comparison made in verses 18 through 22. What is the significance of Jesus' response to those who came to Jesus with this observance that John's disciples and the Pharisees practiced fasting and Jesus and his disciples didn't? Well, fasting was prescribed for all Jews, uh, particularly on the Day of Atonement. And this is Leviticus chapter 16, verse 29. This was seen as an act of repentance. When the Pharisees came along, they promoted voluntary fasts, mainly on, on Monday and Thursday. And we have a reference to this in Luke chapter 18, 12, where the Pharisee says, I fast twice a week. Well, the twice a week is Monday and Thursday. This was an act of piety, okay? They were proving their piety, their holiness by what they're doing. It became a ritual. So simply put, they, they made a spiritual discipline into a ritual for looking holy. Jesus' reference to a wedding indicates that he is the bridegroom and that it was not time for sorrow, as a fast would indicate, but rather it's a time for celebration. Jewish weddings were extravagant times of feasting with much joy and celebration. And this is what Jesus likened his presence with these folks with and his disciples. It wouldn't be until Jesus' death on the cross when the guests of the bridegroom would experience much sorrow and fast figuratively because the, the bridegroom is going to the cross to pay for uh, the, the price, pay the price for sin, the bride price with his blood. And so there will be a day of sorrow. But while the bridegroom is with, there's feasting and there's joy. I believe that when Jesus was sitting at the table, uh, feasting with the tax collectors and the sinners, there was much laughter in the place. There was joy. There was just this over uh, filling presence of, of joy because Jesus is there. Our next section is new patches on old garments and new wines in old wineskins. And this is uh, seen in Mark chapter uh, 2, verses 21 and 22. So let's read this section. No one sews a patch, 
of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. Our next question, what is the meaning of Jesus' reference to the patching of an old garment with a new unshrunk piece of cloth and a new wine and new wine poured into an old wineskin? Well, what Jesus is illustrating here is an attempt to bind the newness of the gospel with old, the old religion of Judaism. It's futile as trying to patch the old garment with a new unshrunk piece of cloth or pouring of new wine. And new wine was unfermented. And so if they poured unfermented new wine into an old wineskin, the old wineskin would burst because it had become brittle with age. The new patch will shrink away when it gets wet and it will pull away from the old garment and cause the hole to come back. And so it's basically pointless. So Jesus' illustration here is that the old is not compatible with the new. The old religious ways are not compatible with the new gospel pointing to righteousness. As one commentator points out, Jesus came to introduce something new not to patch up something old. This is what salvation is all about. In doing this, Jesus doesn't destroy the old, the law, but he fulfills it, just as an acorn is fulfilled when it grows into an oak tree. There's a sense in which the acorn is gone, but its purpose is fulfilled in greatness. I like, I like that, and I wanted to share that with you. Well, our next section, Lord of the Sabbath, verses 23 to 28. Let's take a look. And this is our, our final section that we come to today. And it says, One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. And as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are, you, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did? when his companions were hungry and in need. In the days of Abathar, uh, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. In this section, we come to question number 15. What is the accusation of the Pharisees against Jesus' disciples in verses 23 to 24? They're full of accusations. They accuse Jesus of blasphemy and he proved them wrong. Okay, but they're, look at, even after seeing the miracle of healing, which verified that Jesus is the Son of Man, that he has the authority to forgive sin and also to heal the body, here they're accusing him again. And this time they're accusing him of breaking the Sabbath. In actuality, the disciples did nothing wrong by going through the grain fields and picking some of the heads of grain. This was allowed according to Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 25, which reads, If you enter your neighbor's grain field, you may pick kernels with your hands, but you must not put a sickle to his standing grain. The religious leaders added additional regulations to the law, and so they interpreted the disciples' action as violating the Sabbath in four ways. Here's what they came up with. Because they were walking through, picking the heads of grain, they were reaping, they were threshing, they were winnowing, and they were praying, preparing for food all in the same moment. Isn't that amazing what they're accusing them of? See how their rules uh, be, made them hypersensitive to breaking laws. Well, question number 16, how did Jesus respond uh, to, to their accusation? And what's his point? Verses 25 to 28. Well, Jesus referred to the incident of 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. David's use of the holy bread, uh, which is the show bread or consecrated bread. And David and his men, they were hungry and they came and they needed some bread. The only bread available was the consecrated bread that was replaced by the fresh bread that uh, was baked. This bread was originally restricted to the priests. And what they would do is they would uh, replace that bread with fresh bread. And the, the bread from the previous day was given to the priests. Well, only the priests could eat that bread. And that was out of Leviticus chapter 24, verses 8 and 9. 
And uh, here it says, this bread is to be set out before the Lord regularly, Sabbath after Sabbath, on behalf of the Israelites as a lasting covenant. It belongs to Aaron and his sons who are to eat it in a holy place because it is a most holy part of their regular share of the offerings made to the Lord by fire. And so Jesus' point in bringing this up is that human need is more important than religious ritual. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Sabbath was meant to serve God's people. The Pharisees were so steeped in tradition and ritual that they became very legalistic in their beliefs. They ended up with a rigid set of rules that they were burdened in keeping and unrealistically expecting others uh, to follow as well. Well, Jesus said that human need is greater than uh, ritual. And this is what his point is. And he said, Jesus, he said about himself, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus provides Sabbath rest. Yep. Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to be, to be served, but he has come to serve. And it's in Jesus that we find rest for our weary souls. And so Jesus is the bread of life and so forth. So we'll see this all unfold uh, as we continue on. Well, this concludes lesson number four today. And I hope you're uh, encouraged and I hope you're, you're keeping up going through uh, our time together and so forth, keeping up with the study guides. Let's close in prayer. Our Father God, thank you for this picture of Jesus who is Lord. We see that his Lordship is over the spiritual realm, over the, the physical realm. We thank you, Lord, that you have authority to heal, to forgive. We thank you that you gather people that you love and care about. And we see this over and over uh, unfolding in your word. And we thank you for this time together. And we pray for encouragement and hope for everyone here today. And that, that each of us will encourage others as we have been encouraged. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our next lesson is, is lesson number five, and it is Mark chapter 3, verses 1 to 35. I encourage you to read on ahead and uh, continue to download the study guides. You can go back, and if you've missed a lesson, please pick it up. You can go to our YouTube channel under Amazing Grace Church St. Paul, and you can see all of our videos there on our YouTube channel, and uh, take a look. Also, go to our website, agstpaul.com, and the study guide for this week is there. Well, God bless you, and may you have a great rest of the day and a great rest of the week. I'll see you next time.